Good morning, good, good afternoon, morning. good evening, everyone. What a delight to be with you from here at L'Ecole on Place Vendôme with Caroline Benzaria and also Céline gazlan Duc, who is our kind and dear moderator, who will be gathering, as usual, your questions and comments in the Q&A at the end of our discussion of how does the world of animals inspire jewelry. Today, we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be exploring in a really beautiful world of the world of how on earth the animals inspire all of us since the beginning of time. Absolutely since we began to be humans, we've looked at animals around us. We've wanted their feathers, we've wanted their claws, we've wanted different aspects of the animals to give us protection, to give us strength, to give us courage, to connect us with the heavens above. Today, while we discuss all that, by the way, you have available to you, as those of our dear students in Asia know, you have Mandarin, if you want to click for Mandarin, simultaneous translation with our lovely translators. You have Cantonese, and you also have Japanese. Just click the little icon, and there you go. You'll have simultaneous translation. Let's jump right in, Caroline, and let's look at this beautiful illustration we have in front of us of a real landmark book that was done by a man named Verneuil, a designer who proved with this gorgeous book, which is online on Gallica, that the animal in all its aspects, not just the usual animal, but the hummingbird, the uh, swallow, the frog, the chicken, the toad, the snake even, the, all the different insects could be so beautiful in the way they inspire our imaginations. And of course that was archetypal in Art Nouveau. And what was Art Nouveau but tremendously infused with inspiration from Asia. As we can say and see looking at that illustration, it's very clear. Already, we're jumping into our discussion. We need to be in Asia because our exhibition, Nicole's exhibition, is going on right now in Asia until in Japan at the Antomedia Tech until May 7th. If you're anywhere near Japan, make plans and go and see it. It is unique in the world, beautifully curated by the, the wonderful curators at Intermedia Tech with a selection of gorgeous, plumed jewels, flying bird jewels, animal jewels. Also, if you're interested in the same kinds of subject, you can, for example, study Phoenix here with Caroline and me yes. for 3,000 years of Chinese gold, which is right here in the building on Place Vendôme in L'Ecole until May 1st. That gives us some context on how we can look at animals in jewelry. And today, our real subject is going to have three chapters, right, Yes, Caroline? absolutely. The first one would be natural materials. So in that sub chapter, we are going to discuss, study, see uh, 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 what material nature provide to the jeweler. And uh, there are many, and some are very surprising. Yes. Uh, the second part for an, inspi an inspired creativity will be uh, focusing on uh, what type of form uh, the animals are going to give to uh, the jeweler uh, and stimulation for the imagination. And that's a very big part of it, of course. Uh, all the different forms are in nature. And the last one, the, conver the conference of the birds, uh, it will be how the juror uh, give an honor to uh, the birds, uh, especially the birds, the avian uh, form in uh, the art of jewelry. Yes, we make a concentration on birds, especially because the uh, exhibition is on right now and anti yes. tech. But animals of all sorts inspire us. And we will look at other animals indeed today. Yes, because all form, it's very democratic mm -hmm. in fact, and uh, we understand the form very easy. That's for sure. But first we start with feathers uh, as a matter. Uh, the feather, maybe you don't know, but it's uh, one of the first material used in the first uh, jewel. 
the way of making jewel, feather is in it. And here we can see on the left uh, the bird, the aigrette. And uh, in India, uh, at the end of 16th century, 17th century, uh, technique was uh, realized around the formation of the aigrette that became uh, a jewel for the head. And as we can see, uh, in the miniature, in the center of the screen, you have a Shah Jahan, uh, which is uh, uh, having in his left hand an aigrette. Sometimes an aigrette is the name of the jewel. It comes from the bird aigrette, but sometimes you can have feather of heron. Mm -hmm. This one is uh, metallized uh, and then uh, Sometimes you have an adjunction of real feather. Uh, the ornament is called in Indian sarpe, and it's a symbol of power. Uh, the power that you take, the strength from the animal. And as we know, uh, Europe is very keen of uh, Orient, attracted by Orient and all the exchange in 18th century. Uh, the aigrette uh, arrived in uh, France and especially to the court. And Marie Antoinette, uh, which is very uh, known for her all type of eccentricity, how she dressed the jewel and all that, uh, of course, she's going to catch it immediately. And she uh, uh, takes it as a jewel immediately. And she loves also uh, having very high hair, high. So she's going to ask her, her, her hairdresser, Leonard, to multiply all type of poof and uh, pieces of hair, make it very voluptuous, and, but very high. And in it, as you can see, she is going to put the aigrette. And with Marie Antoinette, the aigrette will be metallized with pearls and diamond and real feather. And that will be in vogue uh, through 19th century and until the, the beginning of 20th century, in the 30s. You can yes. still find the, the aigrette with the La Belle Otero, or, or, or it, it's still fashionable. The idea of combining the diamonds, as we can see with the, the painting of Marie Antoinette, the diamonds actually look like feathers. They're pointing up, they're pointing toward the sky, and then the feathers continue from the diamonds. People adore adorning their heads with feathers. They yeah, have because it's a way to, you have a movement, yes. so it, it just goes with the head. It's fun. It's fest, it's festive. Yes, and it reaches toward the sky, and it's actually the symbolism of reaching toward the sky. Yeah. The idea that birds can escape gravity, they can fly that has obsessed humans since the beginning of time. Oh, okay. We wanted to fly, now we can fly. We made oh. machines that look like oh. birds. So the idea of feathers as a jewel, the, and they have the jewel-like quality, as our gemologists can tell us. These feathers in particular, we love in class to make our students guess and say, what is this? Yes. Now we're saying it's feathers, but we like to have them guess first. Mm -hmm. And they will say turquoise, they will say enamel, they will say all kinds of things, but not feathers. Right. These are feathers. These are kingfisher feathers. In fact, scholars who've done research on this think that one of the sources of gold that helped build those fabulous Angkor Wat temple structures was trading gold from the, from the Khmer culture with China for feathers. So Chinese gold coming there and feathers going to China. Uh, the, this kind of feather, this kingfisher feather jewelry, Tian Sui, has been recorded in China since the Han Dynasty, so more than 2,000 years ago. It's hard to find remnants, of course. It's fragile. It's a marquetry done by cutting little bits of feathers from this exquisite little bird and making marquetry with them to make flowers, to make all these beautiful motifs. In the, on the left, we see a pin, a hair pin, of course, again connected with putting it in the hair, that is part of the seminal collection at the Musée des Arts Décoratifs in the jewelry gallery, where we take you when you come to class here in Paris. It was from Bévé Vert. Bévé Vert is one of the founders of that museum.
In the middle, at the Musée Guimet, which you can also see, you can feast your eyes on it at the Musée Guimet here in Paris, that's a crown probably for a wedding ceremony. Interesting, because it has phoenix. It has all the motifs that would have been for an empress, for a noble person. What happens in the 19th century and into the 20th is democratization. So now it's possible on your wedding to be an empress yourself. And all these motifs are all the motifs connected to the kingfisher feather and the red and the phoenix that link you to a happy life. On the right, we're lucky, we're very lucky. Nelly Saunier is one of the people that preserves intangible patrimony of different sorts. In her sake, in her case, she's preserving marquetry of feathers in a very unique way, using feathers, by the way, that are completely ethically correct. You know what an animal lover I am. I research so carefully. They are collections of birds who molted their feathers naturally, for example. And Nellie makes exquisite jewels like this, this Piaget bracelet, with a 24-carat tanzanite setting off the marquetry of feathers. Yes, that gorgeous burst of turquoise and blue that you see is all kingfisher feathers. Well, when it comes to insects, you know in class I love scarabs, but I like scarabs more at a distance, <laughs> Caroline. Okay. <laughs> I took over <laughs> insects. Yes, oh boy. It goes with, uh, in 19th century, uh, in Europe, in France in particular, you have an interest for uh, natural science and uh, we do research, so you have the Musée uh, Natural of uh, Science, we go abroad and study and all that uh, is going to bring a, an interest and uh, people are going to speak about that. They will go to the uh, exhibition, universal exhibition, yes. and they'll see that there is a pavillon devoted, dedicated to... Um, entomology, uh, Entomology, right? <laughs> exactly, all the bee and uh, all the insectology as well. So. Here you can see on the left uh, an, uh, a dress, uh, English dress, uh, 19th century in muslin, and with the embroidery uh -huh. of coleoptera. Beetle shells. Uh, beetle shells, yes, exactly. And what is uh, embroidered is a strong part of the wing, because you have the soft under. It's a technique that comes from uh, India, uh, at the end of 16th century, uh, 17th century, mm. in the Mughal court. And of course, uh, it was, uh, trans the transmission was, uh, or it was adopted by uh, England, why they were in established, <laughs> if we can say, colonized, the India at that time. Uh, it will be very fashionable uh, in India, in, uh, of course, uh, the, English uh, will wear this dress, but uh, in the 2030s, and you will see it in London in the Victorian uh, time. It is gorgeous. Uh, and it's, it's because the material, the technique, uh, taxidermia always was used uh, to make jewelry, but sometimes it could be also naturalized that the animal is dead, but you are going to make it look alive. And it's all type of different colors, and uh, it plays with the light, and it's going to really attract the eyes. You have also, in some part of the world, the possibility to wear an, uh, uh, an insect or coleopter alive uh, that you are going to attach with a little... Uh, like a pet, like a little pet alive. Yeah, yeah, you will have a gold <laughs> chain, and, uh, and uh, it's, uh, you can see that in India, Sri Lanka, and in Mexico as well. It's a tradition. But here, we go back to our test, or the, the, this uh, tradition, and with Alphonse Auger, he was trained by Boucheron, and he's going to do a pendant, absolutely ravissant, uh, it, and it represents a scarab, and he is going to add enamel with it, and you have a, at the end a little amulet, 
and it's very representative of the Egyptomania uh, uh, mania, Egypt, yeah. <laughs> this taste for Egypt, because at the same time, because always taste is connected with history, in 1860, you have the canal, uh, the Suez Canal opening, open. So that's also uh, made Egypt fashionable. The body is real beetle shells. Yes. Real beetle shells. Mm. And on the right, is those, those are real beetle shells also? Yes. And that is done by Gilbert Albert. He was, uh, he was he's Swiss. Uh, at that time, uh, we know that uh, Jean Vendôme was also working with uh, different material. Uh, and then he was very influenced also by Lalique, because mm -hmm. Lalique uh, diversified all the material that was possible to be uh, uh, used to yes. make jewelry, as we know. True. Yeah, and this is a two scarab, that a pair of uh, earrings that uh, creates a, a, a new uh, fashion and a new test, uh, for sure. It's stunning, the juxtaposition of the reds, the orange is the green, the natural scarab shell, and the gems. Yes, really beautiful. Yes. It's mixing, it really mix the idea of mixing uh, material all together, not only stone. And yes. not only stone, we can have it with the next uh, slide that shows horn, ivory, mm -hmm. and shell. Uh, horn. Uh, of course, we continue in 19th century to be very interested by this uh, new material. Horn comes, it's keratin, so it comes from nails uh, or the hooves of a mammal. And we find that here, <laughs> it's at the source. And we use it to make comb, usually. Mm -hmm. But here you can see that Henri Vever, uh, created, uh, imagine this old comb with these two green eyes with emerald. And uh, you can, I should say that it's not so easy. No. Uh, I mentioned it, uh, we should also mm -hmm. remind that that's because it's very hard and uh, breakable. Therefore, mm -hmm. uh, you have to be very cautious when you work and uh, also, you have another, uh, it's thermal uh, um, plastic, so it's a way that you're going to shape at the same time this material. Uh, all that said and done and done and said, I remind here that uh, in 1975, the Washington Convention uh, just uh, ruled all the use of this material that we are seeing today all together through mm -hmm. jewelry, protecting the species in danger and the fauna as well as flora. Yes. And, 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 and speaking of protection, thanks to global warming, there is a phenomenon in the middle, which is mammoth ivory, right? Right, right. It's mammoth. mammoth. So we ivory. have to remember this is from this is a, a mammoth that died. I don't know, hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of years ago, right? Right, right. And this uh, Taurus head, it's a ring. It's done by uh, Aruni Klosowska de Rola. And she is uh, Japanese and Swiss. Uh, she is a uh, uh, king of uh, animals. She, is, uh, she has an obsession for animals. She will be looking at Jericho a lot because Jericho is a French painter. Jericho was uh, also extremely interested by animals and uh, as uh, obsession uh, has a very good quality is to have be a source of inspiration. And therefore, she's going to realize this yeah. in ivory of mammoths. Yeah, and, we're, and, right, and we were very lucky that she was our first exhibition here at L'Ecole. We learned a lot about her work. She's extremely inspiring. She makes me think of almost like a jeweler, Rosa Bonheur, because she also wants to look at the soul of the animal, into the soul, and really give the animal personality. Speaking of personality, 
When we talk about love presents and love jewelry, the piece on the left might be one of the most particular love jewels in history. Prince Albert and Queen Victoria had a great love story. Prince Albert died young. Queen Victoria stayed in mourning all her life. It's because she wore black all her life that even nowadays we wear the little black dress because she was the primordial influencer. Oh, understanding that their love was so important, Prince Albert wanted to show her how he was a macho man and he would shoot deer on the estate on Balmoral and offer the deer to her. And then those little white jewels on that necklace are the teeth of the deer with the clasp dating and saying, saying the date and saying every single one of these deer was shot by Albert for Victoria. It's a beautiful looking necklace. It has that kind of meaning, which gives us a chance to think about what humans seek from the actual animal materials. It's called predation. You could think of it almost like a, an, a, an early vaccine. Whatever the animal had, the strength, the virility, the protection, the courage, the fierceness, by wearing something from the animal. Since we've been humans, we had the idea we could take on those attributes, protect ourselves, be stronger. For example, in the middle, it's called a nine stone jewel, the Navaratna. In the, it's Indian, and it has back-to-back -back tiger's claws. Do you see? So the tiger's claws are this way, back-to-back, -back, protecting the person who wears it. Not only one tiger's claw, but two on each motif with the stones that are li linked with protection and good luck. On the right, well, with modern art, we have some very particular characters, some very strong ladies, and this lady is Teresa Milero, who likes, in, she's Portuguese, and she experiments and pushes boundaries about, about what do we see as precious. In this case, shark teeth. She's making reference, of course, to all the way back in time, the shark tooth was seen as a talisman. The shark is fierce, you have the tooth, you're protected. She's turning the teeth in, that's a bracelet, where the teeth are going to go in on your wrist. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So thought-provoking and connected to how we humans have found beauty and inspiration in animals always. Right? Yes. yes. And again, we, have, we, we, don't, uh, we don't go too far from the sea. We are with Galusha and skins. And this is skins of fish that are, is going to inspired the, the, the creator, the designer. Uh, Galusha, this is a, a skin of ray or shark, so both uh, in the sea. And Jean-Claude Galusha, who was a gantier for La Pompadour, 18th century in France, La Marquise de Pompadour, gloves, glove, gloves, maker. glove maker, glove maker, uh, found a process, thank you, <laughs> found a process to uh, soften the skin and dye the skin. And here we can, and this is not new. It was done in Japan seven, uh, in the seventh century already, but it came to Europe in the 16th century and then in 18th century, it's true that Jean-Claude Galusha uh, made it uh, in vogue and, uh, and transform it. So we have this first bracelet uh, done by Damiani, uh, which is uh, an Italian uh, designer. And you have this blue bracelet. And on the top, you have the uh, dragonfly with uh, egg marine and uh, all the wings are with a uh, colored diamond. And you know what? You can take off the, uh, dragon, the dragonfly and put it as a brush or a pendant or have it just on your bracelet. And next, the other bracelet, the de Griso Gono. Uh, it's coming from the collection Happy Sweet Summer. It's mm -hmm. also a beautiful title. You have the little frog on it. And next, from the creator Jean-François Perignon. Uh, he's uh, from Swiss and he adore to work leather. And he's going to uh, also add to leather 
you can see it, uh, different uh, material that and stone, or you can uh, recognize lapis lazuli, but uh, you have also really different uh, material like iron and, uh, and it's very designed. But knowing that, you can also remember that leather, it's uh, on your skin, ex extremely warm and soft, and it's going to marry your skin in some way. So it's a very new way uh, to uh, create, uh, diversify the vision. Exactly. Thinking of how we find different elements that are from animals that we adhere to and that we find great value in from thousands of years, probably, African people have collected animal hair, elephant hair. Elephant hair is enormous and long and tough. And they, it, it's connected to the wisdom, the intelligence, the kindness of the elephant, of course. So finding these elephant hairs along the path where the elephants migrate has been considered a way to protect and find luck and weave jewels mm -hmm. to put on your body and protect you. We have an extraordinary uh, privilege today to um, look at these pieces because these are um, pieces from the actual museum, the living museum of Van Cleef and Arpels from the patrimony. And these are pieces you normally would see in a museum exhibition. And we have a chance when we really look at this to see the quality of the elephant hair. That's elephant hair. How beautiful it is, how durable, and how it would last forever. And when it's against your skin, you feel protected. And it's a linking with all the beautiful qualities of the elephant. The way that the gold was done, this is a 1973 piece. Look at how the gold is worked. It looks like elephant hair in gold. Mm -hmm. They had a great understanding of how to aesthetically put that the way it should be. This is something that in the 70s, Alain Delon, all the sort of strong guys would have these bracelets, these elephant bracelets, and wear them against their skin, wanting to connect themselves with the culture, wanting to connect themselves with this whole aesthetic, which was so much 70s. Here you have a loop, a double loop. Do you see what that's almost like a figure eight knot mm -hmm. with the gold looking like the elephant hair and then the elephant hair. It's hard to even believe that the structure and durability and beauty of that elephant hair. Each hair is something like 90 centimeters long and unbelievably tough. If we uh, go back to the slide, we see that it, this is something that the family was linked with. It's a family story all the way back to 1917, World War I. They're, they're, having a, they're making a joke in the face of real sadness. Place Vendôme, might, the Germans might be there any minute. And they're saying, oh, Van Cleef and Arpels is making lucky jewels, talisman jewels, and it looks like this little boy is taking another one of my hairs from my tail <laughs> to make a lucky jewel. Because they did, they made jewels saying, if you want to be lucky, believe in luck. And they meant it, the family really meant it. So on the left and on the right, we see spectacular examples again of taking textures that are Asian or archeological textures and marrying them, combining them with the actual elephant hair. And those are, whenever it says Van Cleef and Arpels collection, those are in the museum, which you'll have a chance to see when the museum pieces travel and you see them at an exhibition. It always make plans to go to those exhibitions to see how, for example, animals can reach, make us reach further and further to more and more inspired creativity for our second chapter. How is it that we go to such inspired creativity with animals? Well, if we're going to think about inspired, if we're going to think about fairy tales, if we're going to think about what makes children happy, go to the museum shop at the Clooney and what do you find? Every kind of stuffed unicorn. Everybody wants a unicorn. And a unicorn is this exquisite creature that only comes to a young maiden who's pure of heart and will lay its head in her lap and be her pet and confer all kinds of powers on her. The one in the middle, the Van Cleef and Arpels one, all three are delightful. We're going to look at them quickly. But the one in the middle catches exactly the essence of the unicorns you'll see in medieval tapestries. Come to the Clooney Museum with us and go see. There's a gorgeous room dedicated just to those tapestries. It's that delicate flowers, the perfect universe of nature that actually Vernet uh, refers to in his illustrations we showed you and Grasset talks about in his, in his introduction, that in the Middle Ages they found a way of mastering a delicate balance of naturalism, realism, and inspiration. Look at the way the rubies, the sapphires, look at the little 
gorgeous little collar around his neck, his sweet face, his perfectly drawn horn, even the details, the way the ruby is set into his eyes. He's sweet, he's gentle. Look at his flying mane, he's prancing, he's proud, all of that. On the left, uh, on the left we have uh, a Reinhold Vasters. If you want to go further into that story, it's a funny story because those pieces were believed to be Renaissance. They catch everything about the Renaissance. They are a Baroque pearl that starts. You find the Baroque pearl in the center. That's the body. You build the animal, the unicorn, out of the Baroque pearl. You frame the whole jewel, appreciate it as a work of art, with enamel, with pearls, with precious stones. Unfortunately, Reinhold Vasters, being German, perhaps kept very good records. And recently, in the in recent 40 years so or so, a bunch of his designs were discovered in the archives of the Victoria and Albert Museum with all his notes, proving that those pieces were made at the end of the 19th century, which means we now call them Neo-Renaissance. It's very fun. And speaking of fun, our cute little unicorn on the right is in the same spirit, really, it's, it's this time in the 60s and 70s, the Jean Vendômes, the Andrew Grimas, the, the Sterlets, and the René Morin, for example, looked back and looked forward. In that, they looked at material, as had the Renaissance artists. And René looks at this gorgeous piece of lapis, and he sees a unicorn head grow out of the lapis. And he uses exquisite French jewelry making technique to have you have the mane with the turquoises and the cute little horn and the beautiful little eye. So this is how, from the very modern to the very ancient, we can find materials and then inspire ourselves to make beautiful wild animals, yes. fantastic animals. Fantastic, yeah, well, and we dream. And then here we have a the phoenix, so well known, he's going to reborn from ashes. And that's a very strong uh, image. And here, this is Jean Schlumberger, a uh, French juror. He started with uh, the famous Elsass Caparelli, uh, famous for working with artists. Uh, especially surrealist artist. At the beginning, he was uh, creating for her just uh, the button. Uh, and then, uh, as an artist, uh, he developed. And uh, after the Second World War, we find him in New York, being the director, artistic director of uh, Tiffany & Co. And uh, he is going to realize and honor uh, fauna and flora and make it very naturalist. But as you can see here in that phoenix uh, done in 1950, uh, honor to the stone, this blue body, uh, yes. aquamarine, and then he is uh, really uh, rebirth <laughs> with diamond. And next you have Pegasus. Pegasus, this is a horse with wings. And it comes from the Greek uh, mythology. He's a son of Zeus and La Gorgone, Medusa. So here, but it's not the first time that we can see uh, in art history representation of a horse with wings. We also have it in the Assyrian tradition. And from the, this tradition, it went to Greece, from Greece went to Rome. And in the Roman tradition, we can find in Hesiod, Theogony d'Hesiod, uh, representation and, uh, of uh, this animal, the horse with wings, as we can find it as well in the Ovid, uh, the metamorphosis of Ovid, of course. Here, it's really done with uh, the idea you have a level of uh, decorative, but you also have a very expressive level of uh, yes. movement, plus this color. There is a, a... The juxtaposition, isn't it, of corals, two corals, the mystery setting, the curved mystery setting right. body. It's a virtuoso, and those little hooves in coral, yeah. everything is perfect. 
Yeah. He has something very alive, and at the same time, he is totally decorative. You have a mix of both. And next, you have Lydia Courtail, and she is a, a designer uh, uh, very well known, and she's going to be a, also inspired by Ovid, Les Metamorphoses of uh, Ovid. And she is going to represent uh, a, a chapter. One day, Zeus see Leda, and Leda, uh, he he wants to seduce her. He finds her so attractive, so he's going to uh, use uh, uh, a way to transform himself into a swan, and he can go to and, and meet her, and she will not see it. And Lydia Courtel found a way to uh, make engraving of the stone, which is a pink ruby. And you have the Zeus as a swan that is holding her like a jewel, not only the woman. Pink the sapphire, sapphire, I think, right? Pink sapphire. Corundum, same right. family, but just yeah. a little paler. Yeah, yeah, sorry, and she's sorry. reversed engraved, right? Yes, yes. Absolutely beautiful. Right, right. So when we talk about finding the material and making a jewel out of it, again, we return to pearl. Uh, Olivier Segura, our scientific director, one of the great experts on pearls, and I, we love Baroque pearls, as does Caroline. Here we have three jewels made out of Baroque pearls, finding the Baroque pearl and creating the jewel around it. The sheep, the Lamb of God, with its standard of the, the, the Christian faith, a, a great Renaissance jewel, all again framed around the pearl. In the middle, a natural freshwater pearl by Mikimoto, taking an Antarqu Antarctic penguin who is f playing. You can even see him sort of flopping on the ice and playing. The bottom is all the Baroque pearl. On the right, Alessio Boschi, an a truly uh, a young, dynamic jeweler who made a unique vision of a shark. The shark is a species that we don't necessarily love, but it's endangered. And the great white shark, we don't even know how many there are. So he makes this great white shark brooch, and a portion of the proceeds go to what he cares about fervently, which is protecting the sea and the creatures of the sea. The shark nurtures inside it, if you open it up, a pair of earrings looking like shark fins in, natural in naturally shaped Keshi Baroque pearls. The belly is in rose gold, and what we call the ajourage, the opening, is a coral reef. And you have one, two, three, four, five, at least seven uh, naturally shaped Baroque pearls, including, as Caroline loves to point out, the head, the mouth, the, yeah. everything about the head. He saw that, and he was inspired to build the jewel out of that pearl shaped just like that. In fact, there's a dream around the, the shape, and then the, the, the object arrived, the, the, the jewel arrived. The, 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 that's Exactly, Caroline. Yeah. Exactly, and we can see that very much in in your uh, geological your, your, your audacity, rose yes. opal elephant on the right. Right, yes. the same. Yes, but first Daniel Brush yes. yes. and the rabbit, the bunny bracelet, done in 1980 when uh, we discover in uh, Australia uh, diamond, pink diamond, in the mine of Argyle. And Daniel Brush uh, just uh, uh, add uh, bakelic, uh, which is a plastic <laughs> resin, with this head of rabbit, which is uh, all uh, encrusted of uh, pink, diamond. Uh, pink diamond. And then he engraved the bakelite, right? Exactly. To make more bunnies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are going all over the place. <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, it's full of joy, and that's. Uh, really uh, a successful piece. It I is mean, indeed. Uh, full and, of poetry. I and perfect say. for the Lunar yeah. New Year, right? Oh, right. Oh, oh, also, yes. And the elephant next. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, done with uh, uh, opal, pink opal, which is very fragile. And the level of naturalism is uh, astonishing. And he had, again, a very su the surprise of the colors of the pearl, of the, not pearls, but the, the, the stones with it. And that's a very original piece. 
almost the, what we call anthropomorphic is something that has endless possibilities. Finding something cute and funny about an animal, that's another one. The other rabbit is great for the Lunar New Year. It's a rabbit that goes fishing. Raymond Yard, a personal favorite, a great success story, goes from messenger, picked out by the Rockefellers, and suddenly he's jeweler to the stars. Not suddenly, of course, he was a great businessman. And one of his, his trademarks were these funny rabbits and funny chickens and all kinds of funny little animals uh, engaging in human activities. And as Carolyn likes to point out, he has little onyx boots with, be with a baguette cut diamond socks. Very elegant. Yes, yes, that's Very true. 1930. <laughs> and on the right, that little duck, with the little lady duck with her hat clip could be going off to an Easter parade. And she was part of a, a humorous animals exhibition that we adored that we had in the museum space on Place Vendôme of the Van Cleef and Arpels boutique. Mm. Indeed, birds talk to us, we talk to them, animals talk to us, it's all about animals. But the reason why we're mentioning particularly birds is because we took inspiration too from this book, yes. which is called The Conference of Birds, right, yes. Caroline? Which is yes, written in uh, 1177. By a yes. Persian poet, yes. a Sufi, uh, right? Sufi poet, uh, one of the most well-known Sufi poets. He was born in the same uh, uh, city as uh, Omar Khayyam. And he, he, he wrote the... This is in French, but you can find it easily in English. If you, it just the Seamorg is interesting because it shows us the, the Seamorg, which was the god to the birds, which is the Persian version of the phoenix. Uh, so it's the idea that the birds in the animals, through the animals, we can find everything that's important and everything that's heavenly, right? And in this case, when we talk birds in flight, this is something we adore discussing at the school, which is that Art Nouveau is really, one of the nicknames of it was Japonisme. It's Art Nouveau is Asia coming to Europe and inspiring Europe. And in these three pieces, we have an actual gorgeous Meiji period comb, Japanese from a private collection, uh, using birds and, and animals in the heavens with encrusted mother of pearl and gems. In the middle, we have Feliz, the great pioneers of enamel, bringing Asian influences, again, the crane, making them into enamel pendants with bamboo and all the exquisite motifs. And on the right, Boutet de Bonvel, who's so well known for his portraits, his paintings in Art Deco, was actually a jewelry designer of renown during Art Nouveau in the 1890s. But as we just enjoyed going over with our students in Japan last week, and I know some of you are with us, we put that side by side with a tsuba, uh, excuse my pronunciation, T-S-U-B-A, a sword guard for a katana, and you see that the belt buckle is incorporating the aesthetic of the tsuba because J Japan, China, Asia, Art Nouveau, they are like this, they are one. Here we have bats of the night. Now, the bat in Chinese, of course, the fu word, the, the ideogram is also happiness. So the bats of happiness are perfect. Nowadays we know bats protect us from insects and, and, and save us, really save the environment. But the Europeans used to be, find them very spooky and scary. Again, back to Ovid's metamorphosis, there were these poor girls, the daughters of King Minias, who were cursed, according by Dionysus, because they refused to party with the bacchants in the mountains, very odd, and turned into bats. So there's this idea that the bats could be the negative of the feminine. And during Art Nouveau, women adopted that and loved it, celebrated it, because these are daring women who want to break the rules. We have two rings for very daring women here. First of all, a heart-shaped moonstone with bats all the way around and blue enamel. It's in the Museum of Decorative Arts, and that's the edgy, dangerous side of women. That was a gift from a woman to a woman who loved each other. And on the right, our friend Boutet de Montvel again. He has this spooky bat lady kind of pushing up the opal, which is again, opals, moonstones, those are the spooky, fun, edgy stones of Art Nouveau. It speaks to you of these birds of the night. Are they the ladies or are they the birds? Are they the bat, which of course is a mammal? And again, the mammal that flies, it's all part of that, that inspiration that was found in exotic animals, especially connected with the feminine, with the women. Yes. 
Yes, speaking of which, the peacock. Ah, the peacock. We oui. in India, peacock is extremely uh, uh, recognized as uh, representing royalty, uh, representing fertility and uh, richness. It's a, it's a real uh, motif in India. And we can see that uh, portrait of Lady Mary Curzon uh, is going to wear a dress uh, with this motif. Uh, we cannot see it maybe properly, but believe me, it's a pecan motif. It's done by uh, Worth, the Maison Worth, in, in the early 20th century. And the technique is uh, coming from India, and the, the material the, 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 is also coming from India, and it's all done with thread of uh, uh, metal. And it's all peacocks. It's, it's all peacocks. And in the middle, that peacock jewel is being worn by the lady on the right, correct? Who used Absolutely. to be a flamenco dancer. Yeah, and, and that becomes. And, and uh, becomes uh, the darling, uh, even the mother of the child of uh, uh, Mahaja of uh, Kapurtala, who the met wife? her. Wife, actually, he marries yeah, her. Yes, he marries right? her. And he, he offered her this, uh, this uh, peacock uh, so brush, which is, you can wear it in your hair, you can wear it as a brush, you can wear it as a pendant. It's, a, it's all trans about transformation. She has it in her hair in the picture, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. So the peacock is forever connected to this, ex this enchanting, mysterious feminine, right? Yes. The, the, uh, the beauty and show of a feminine person. Right. Well, it, in, in Europe, it's, it's in, a, in our, our tradition, Pican is seen like a sign of being really proud. But uh, here you can see that uh, with uh, Gustave Beaugrand, who realized seven uh, different uh, peacock. You have the one, she's just, the, the, the animal is uh, doing la roue, is open, how would like you say Like a fan. Like a fan, yeah. One is in diamond, all diamond, and the other one is done with opal, and that's, it's more colorful, it's, uh, it's extremely decorative, and you have really a, a level of refinement uh, in the representation of the animal, and the, it's as decorative as naturalist. It is, I both naturalist and fun, yeah, with his little, his little uh, feet gripping onto the big mm, pearl. Mm, Absolutely delightful. It's a radiant. And of course, you mentioned in the be very beginning about the feathers and wanting to sort of connect ourselves with the glamour. Uh, also, this idea of flying, that almost jewels that seem to fly. Here we have three examples with the, with the, um, the hummingbird and the swallow, uh, perfect examples of uh, how the flying jewel can be connected to the feathers connected. It even was, it even caused endangerment of some species during the 20s because people were crazed for these feathers. All three of these jewels so, show great movement. The swallow on the right, the flying is helped out by using enamel, black enamel on the wings, mm -hmm. juxtaposed against the diamond. The, uh, in the middle, the bird has actually a spray of diamonds and emeralds moving up that make you think of the feathers. And then the Chalmay piece on the left has actual black feathers combined with the diamonds. This is an example of how we find ourselves inspired as the jewelers inspire all different ways to innovate. The Sterlet piece, which is in the Birds in Paradise exhibition in Japan, uh, the gold is actually worked to a point where it's silky and soft. It feels like feathers. And then the, the little little diamond lozenges feel like another glittery aspect of the feather that's been made by the jeweler. And then, of course, his fun and humorous coral carved head is a triumph of the lapidary working the coral to make you see his little face and his expression. Yeah. And then diamonds even set in his beak so that you get just the right balance of naturalism and conceptual art. In the middle, that eagle, well, it's, of course, the National Bird of America. It's a Van Cleef and Arpels Museum piece again. And if we close in on it, we see work that's done 
Well, first of all, let's look at his head. To catch the essence of a bird, it's that eye, the way a bird looks at you. It looks from the side, not straight on. Look at the feathers, how well they're caught in the work of the gold. And the closer you go to him, the more you get his sense that he's peering at you with his intelligence. Eagles are incredibly intelligent, which is one of the reasons why they were so admired by Native Americans. They could fly, they could defy gravity. And in Native American art, notably Zuni and Navajo, they work with exactly those medallions of malachite, mother of pearl, and pieces of coral to make their jewels. This is completely Van Cleef and Arpel's really ultimate high jewelry, but it's delving into that world, which is kind of a perfect 1972 aesthetic. On the right, this marvel with the pink flamingos is a part of the Noah's Ark collection, as was your Pegasus, Caroline. Mm -hmm. And the turquoise is so perfect, it's like a limpid pool of water, but it's a, it's a turquoise. And then the pink flamingo's feathers are curling around back below it using pink sapphires. And by the way, a piece of Van Cleef and Arpel's trivia, the black, the faceted black stone, only spinel, never black diamonds. Because the spinel is what they see as the right kind of black stone to use. Mm -hmm. So there you have an example of the, the gentle too, the gentle loving, the aspect that flamingos are partners. And you see that, how they're twining together and even creating a heart out of their sort of embrace. All of that, of course, is thanks to the aesthetic virtuosity of the jewelers. And when we talk about that, we need to look at three geniuses, con modern individual artists. Wallace Chan with his Hira. There's a splendiferous peacock named Hira because Hira chose the peacock as her animal, her sacred animal. She put the eyes of the Argus, her guardian, on the peacock. And it, that's one of the reasons why the peacock is seen as royal to Europeans. And in the middle, this is used, by the way, Chan, Wallace Chan is using titanium there. And in the middle, Anna Hu, who loves music, she was a violinist, Nocien, for the, for the oh, work of art and music. Really, really she has a, a crane that's holding a, a jade flute. And on the right, Cindy Chow simply takes feathers and does graduated colors with diamonds and sapphires to catch that essence of the feathers. In that Vernet book, which I recommend to everyone, you can find it on Gallica, digital access. You can see it huge, high def. Uh, Celine can give you the link if you want. Eugène Grasset wrote the introduction to that book. And he said, these are the possibilities for animals, dear readers. It's not just a new thing. It's an old thing, really. It's, it's there forever. And it's truly audacious, marvelous, and prodigious what you can do with animals. You don't have to stick to any one particular tradition. You can look at the Middle Ages. You can look at ancient Greece. You can look at Japan. You can look at China. You can look at Vietnam. You can look at Africa. And you can find ways to influence your creation with animals. Which leads us to also the ways in which jewelers influence their and make their creations is, as we've seen very much, going all the way from Caroline talking to us about the insect wings. Precious ornamental gems can be all kinds of ornamental gems, not just ruby, diamond, sapphire, emerald. And on April 13th, in English, live online, our dear Paul Paradis and Marie-Law Cassius Duranton will discuss this precious ornamental gems. And if you have a chance to come to Paris, join us with Leonard Puy and Marianne Mouchard for their special course on modern jewels from the 60s to the 80s, like the Albert Gilbert piece you saw. Mm -hmm. It's a three-course cycle. You take all three courses. You could come the 4th, the 11th, and the 18th. This particular cycle is in French, by the way. So now, what we'd like to do is talk to you about some of your questions. And thank you, dear Celine. I have some questions here for us both. Ah, was hair known as a material for accessories? Whose hair does that belong to? Were there any rules for the person, family, or someone with beautiful hair? Well, that relates to humans. The only time we're really discussing that today is the elephants. But do indeed take a look at some of our sentimental jewelry discussions. And indeed, our course, Louis XIV to Art Deco, we go into hair jewelry in detail. It starts like all trends start. It starts with a lock. A locket holds a lock of hair of someone you love. Then it becomes a crazy trend, and then you have hundreds of women making exquisite jewelry out of hair because more is more is more. 
just to touch on that. But when we come to more with our animals, question, which is the symbol of scarab in ancient time, which is the image reviewed in the 19th century? I think you mean the scarab that was used in ancient times was one specific breed of scarab that was found in Egypt, and it, the amulet that was on the bottom of the exquisite Alphonse Auger piece oui. Alphonse Auger. was the amulet of the type of scarab that is the, and it, it has Kepri in the name, K-H-E-P-R-I, because for the Egyptians, that scarab was part of a god, and that's why you see a man with a beetle head. It's that god, Kepri. But scarab was also, you have 500 uh, yes, breeds. Uh, breeds of yeah. uh, uh, scarabs, uh, including ladybug, etc. And you find it not only in Egypt, you can find it uh, in India, Sri Lanka, uh, Mexico, and you also have it in Brazil. Brazil was one of the first provider of scarab and, and coleoptera and all that. So every uh, country has its tradition and a way to use it and, of course, symbolism. That's, Absolutely. Uh, so you answer for Egypt, but yes. you, of course, uh, in another country, it will be something else. Absolutely. Uh, but the Egyptian one is that particular breed, and as you say, there's so many. The ones in the dresses were not the Egyptian one. Very no, good point. No, yeah. uh, oh, from from Jap India. Perfect. Yes, but, exactly. But, yeah. From the Japan audience, does the frog on the bracelet de, de Grisogono have any symbolic meaning? Yes. Happy sweet summer, yes. I would say. Yes. No? Symbolic of the frolicking and the playing Spring. in summer, seeing the frogs plopping in the pond. Right. Absolutely. Uh, and it has very ancient meaning, too. Because the frog hibernates, it was seen as a symbol of immortality because the frog wakes up from the ice when the ice melts and starts peeping and making little peep, peep, peep sounds. So it was seen as a symbol of being reborn. Mm -hmm. Do people use animal materials because they want to express unique beauty? Yes. Oh, for sure. Yes. Yeah. Because they are marveled by it. And so they are going to be inspired. So. All that is connected. Yes, absolutely. To beauty, to uh, to just transmit this uh, emotion they got from it. Very interesting question. Does Jean Schlumberger's aquamarine also represent the blue bird of happiness? Could be. Could. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it could also be yeah. for a March baby because aquamarine is our birthstone. I know. Mine's coming up. <laughs> Um, interesting, how are the feathers fixed to the metal? Uh, it's not nails, it is some kind of attaching material. And how did they do it in the Han Dynasty? Can't tell you unless we analyze and we find old pieces, but it is some kind of something that makes it attach today. I don't believe Nelly Saunier has described what materials she used. We could research that further and get back to you. I have a feeling some of that might be proprietary. But no, it's not nailed like jewelry. It is fixed in there with some kind of attaching substance. Um, I think that's all our questions. So this is a perfect time to stay with more questions. Stay with us. Join us on when you can. Instagram, either, either a call Asia Pacific or a call Paris. We, the teachers, love to engage with you on Instagram, as you know well, all our dear friends who are with us right now. We continue to discuss, you inspire us, you give us new ideas to go further together, right, Caroline? Absolutely, and we are ready to welcome you. Here. Here. Right. In Paris. Till May 1st, 3,000 Years yes. of Chinese Gold, a very unique exhibition, the Meng Dejuan Collection. Right. Mm. All Thank about gold. Thank you so Chinese. much. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you soon. Bye.